and how appropriate for us this evening. Our message deals with five minutes after Christ died. Some years ago, a movie was made in Hollywood that became one of the most successful ever. It was called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Does anybody remember that? Now, I don't go to movies, but I read. And uh, the idea was archaeologists thought they knew how to find the ancient ark from the tabernacle of Israel. And I understand in the movie they did. But this magnificent chest, 55 inches long, 33 inches square, made of gold, that is, shittim wood covered with gold, and a lid of solid gold called the mercy seat, with two beaten gold angels forming an arch with their wings above the mercy seat, was in ancient Israel the typical throne of God. And the holy Shekinah light dwelt between the cherubim, evidence to Israel that God was with them. The most sacred vessel in all of history. Now, lest you become too concerned, the five minute idea is arbitrary. It could have been one minute or ten minutes. I'll put your mind at ease to that extent. But now, we want to answer the questions that have poured in. And I told you some of your questions were begging for a whole sermon. And now we'd like to give it to you. The Bible says these words in the book of Colossians chapter 2. And I'm beginning with verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphant, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Many are confused about this text, especially in the context of a binding moral law of God in the world today. Let's make it worse. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. Listen to this. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now for those who were confused, you should be more confused. <laughs> now I would like to compound the confusion with the words of Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 17 to 19. I want you to pray that your mind will be clear and you'll grasp this truth. Jesus said, who said it? Jesus. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. 
Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, that's the dot above an I, or one tittle, the crossing of a T equivalent, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one, break how many? Whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now we really got ourselves a conundrum. Paul says he nailed it to his cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink, Sabbath days, new moons. And then he says over further, Jesus abolished in his flesh even the law contained in ordinances for to make in himself of two or twain one new man. So making peace. Now many who like to stumble and I find people desperate in their search for a loophole and many who like to stumble want to use Paul as their stumbling authority. Let's create more confusion. Paul said in Romans seven twelve, the commandment is holy, it's what? And just, and what? That means fair and good. Why would Jesus nail something to the cross that's holy just and good. Doesn't that bother you? Paul said in Romans 7, when I would do good, evil is present with me. How to perform that which is good, I find not. The good that I would, I do not. The evil I say I'm not going to do, that I do. And then he tells us what his problem is. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In my mind, I always want to be a Christian. But there's another law of sin in my members, the flesh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing it into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then Paul, realizing his dilemma, said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And in the last verse, he answered that question. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? amen. The very next verse is verse 1 of chapter 8 of Romans. And it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And when you get on to verse 3, Paul said, for what the law could not do, in the flesh, God sending his own son, sending whom? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin overcame sin in the flesh. That the righteousness, righteousness is right doing. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but that, that's why Jesus came. He came to take our place, to stand the test, to overcome sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be carried out in us, in our flesh, if we're willing to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Now Paul said that the very man people want to use as their authority for stumbling. About 30 years after the cross, James wrote in James chapter 2 and verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you are guilty of all. And in verse 12 of James 2, James says that God's law will be the standard in the judgment. If you commit a crime and go to court, 
They don't just sit up there and talk a while and then throw the book at you. They judge you out of a law. Isn't that right? And God has a standard in the judgment which is his law. Now having said all this, let us begin to understand how simple and clear this truth is. Write it down. Romans 3.20, the Bible says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, doing the law, keeping the law, therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose of the law. It's not supposed to save you. If you run through a red light, you've broken the what? If you have a wreck, the red light is not going to come down and save you. All it does is tell you, if you got good sense, you shouldn't run through here, you might get hurt. But after you get hurt, you need an ambulance and a doctor. The Bible says, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In Romans 4, 15, the Bible says, where there is no law, there's no transgression. Are you with me? Now you know what, I'm a poor man and I've been poor all my life. And I see you all driving here in these beautiful cars. I saw a Lexus back there, I don't know who's it is. But that's a car everybody admires. If there is no law, I can steal that Lexus. And you can't say I've done wrong. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Are you with me? If you throw away the law, you throw away sin. For sin is the transgression of law. 1 John 3, 4. If there is no law, the devil can be saved. If there is no law, adulterers and liars and drug pushers and murderers can be saved. Where there's no law, there's no sin. If there is no law, if Jesus nailed that to the cross and there is no law anymore, these thieves that will steal everything you can accumulate can go to heaven. And if all these folk go to heaven, I'd just soon stay here. Are you following me? Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that where there is no law, there is no sin. And we need to understand very clearly that God has not nailed his moral law to the cross. It is still in force, there's still such a thing as sin, and people still must overcome sin, and they may, may be forgiven sin, through the grace of Christ. The law is God's standard of righteousness. Grace is the ladder we climb in order to reach that standard. Now it's time for us to clear up the apparent confusion. And we are happy to do it. I want to tell you first of all that God has given his truth and it is clear to those who want to know it. I must suggest to you from the Bible that when St. Paul talks about law, he's talking about more than one thing. And now let's prove it. Write down Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 13. Listen to this. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest unto them from heaven and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and commandments, and madest known to them thy holy Sabbath, now listen, and commandest them laws by the hand of Moses. Did you get that? God came down and gave his law, and he also gave laws by the hand of Moses. Daniel 9 and verse 11. Yea, all Israel transgressed thy law, even by departing, 
that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon them, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses thy servant, because we have sinned against him. Did you get it? Here in Daniel 9, he says, Israel has broken thy law, O God, and the curse that's written in the law of Moses is poured out upon us because we have also sinned against him. Now let's go back to the basics. In Exodus, the 19th chapter, God calls Moses up into Mount Sinai. And beginning with chapter 20 and verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. The second one says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The next one says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The next one says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. The next one says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long. The next one says, thou shalt not kill. The next one says, thou shalt not commit adultery. The next one says, thou shalt not steal. The next one says, don't tell lies. And the last one says, thou shalt not covet. These are God's 10 moral laws. They were not for the Jews. They are universal. It is wrong for a Jew to lie. It's wrong for a Hispanic to lie. It's wrong for a black man to lie. It's wrong for a white man to lie. This is God's law. In Exodus 31, 18, the Bible says, God wrote it on two tables of stone with his own finger. Have you got it? That is very important. God wrote his law on tables of stone with his own finger. Moses came down. The children of Israel were worshiping a golden calf. Less than six weeks had gone, and they had gone back into idolatry. Moses was standing there and he slammed those tables down and broke them. And God was about to break off his covenant with Israel. And when repentance came, God forgave them. And now listen, Deuteronomy 10, 1 to 5. Write it down. God said to Moses, hew thee out two tables of stone like unto the first and bring them up into the mountain. Moses cut out two tables of stone, carried them into the mountain, and the Bible says God wrote on those tables the same thing. He had written on the two that Moses broke. This is the doing of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And then God told Moses where to put them. We read it in 1 Kings 8 and verse 9. There was nothing in the ark. And that ark is not Noah's ark, it's that chest I was telling you about. The ark of the covenant. There was nothing in the ark except two tables which Moses put there at Horeb. Horeb and Sinai are the same mountain. Are you with me? Now, I'm trying to go slowly. I want this to be clear. God wrote it on two tables of with his own and they were put inside the ark and there was nothing in there except those two tables which God wrote and Moses received at Horeb. Now, Exodus 24, and I'm going to read verse 4. Exodus 24 and verse 4. Please follow carefully. The Bible says these words. Exodus 24 and verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. And he sent young men of the children of Israel and they offered sacrifices. Moses took half of the blood, put it in basins, half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar and he took the book, the what? God wrote his on two tables of 
Moses has written in a book. And verse 7 says, he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. God's was written on stone. Moses's was written in a book. But as you have learned out here, one text is truth, but we get corroborating evidence. I'm so glad that when the truth is preached, you are not desperate. You don't have to pick out some obscure little verse and bend it and twist it to fit your theology. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31 and verse 9, the Bible says, And Moses wrote this law. Now that's explicit. Who wrote it? And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Moses wrote this law, verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, huh? until they were finished. Verse 26, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against thee. Now, what have we said? God wrote his law himself with his own on two tables of stone, and they were placed inside the ark. Moses wrote this law in a book, and he told the priest to put it in the side of the ark, that it might be there as a witness against them. Moses' law, in a very special sense, pertained only to the Jews. It regulated their worship, and it regulated their society. Would you say amen? amen? Someone said there were laws of health, there were civil laws, and then there was God's law. If you disobey the laws of health, you're going to the hospital. If you disobey the civil laws, you're going to jail. But if you disobey the law of God, you're going to hell. Huh? The sanctuary in Israel was the center of their society and worship. And Moses' laws governed the services of the sanctuary. There were all kinds of feasts. Two of them you ate from the sacrifice. One was Passover and the other was a peace offering. Now you see why Paul said, let no man judge you in meat and in drink. Are you with me? There's nothing about meat and drink in the Ten Commandments. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about a law that pointed to Jesus that was used only by those expecting the Messiah to come as a type, as a symbol, as a representation of his ministry. Every time they killed a lamb, it pointed to the Lamb of God. The lamb from the barnyard can't wash away sin. They were not cleansed by barnyard animals. They were cleansed by faith in the coming lamb of God. And they evinced that faith by the killing of sacrifices. And two of those they roasted and ate. Paul said after Jesus came and fulfilled all of that, don't let any Jews try to make Jews out of you. You are now Christians. Let no man judge you in meat, in drink, in Sabbath days, holy days, new moons, which, now he's got a qualifying word. Don't let anybody judge you in that which. Which what? Don't let anybody judge you in that which was a shadow, a figure, a type, a symbol, a representation of things to come. But the body is of Christ. What do you mean the body is of Christ? The fulfillment, the substance is of Christ. All of this just pointed to him. But once he got here, all of that's over. Would you say amen out there? 
ladies and gentlemen, in Leviticus 23, you've got a list of seven Sabbaths. How many? Seven. None of them is the Sabbath of the Lord. Not one of them came every week. They were annual Sabbaths, which means they came once a year. Now follow closely. One of them was the Day of Atonement. Today it is called Yom Kippur. Have you heard of it? It comes on the 10th day of the seventh month. Now by it coming on a date, rather than a day, it immediately becomes different than the Sabbath of the Lord because it comes on the same day every week. But this ceremonial Sabbath came on a date. Now let me show you something. My birthday, I think, this year comes on Sunday. Next year, my birthday will come on Monday. Next year, my birthday will be on Tuesday. If it comes on a date rather than a day of the week, it can come any day. Still, it was a ceremonial Sabbath. And to this day, the Orthodox Jew, the believing Jew, closes his business on Yom Kippur and goes to the synagogue. I used to live in a very nice section of Washington, D.C. And three blocks from me was a Jewish synagogue. And one day I came home from a trip and every space, everywhere you look, up and down the alley, everywhere was taken by a car. And I wondered, what is this? I can't even park. I had to go three blocks and park and walk to my house. When I got in there, I said, what's going on? And then I happened to look at the news and they said that the Jews today are remembering Yom Kippur. And then it hit me. There's a synagogue near here. They're here on Tuesday. It's a Sabbath. Has nothing to do with the Sabbath of the Lord. It was a ceremonial Sabbath pointing forward to Christ. These religious laws pertained only to the Jews for a set amount of time, and we today are not governed by Jewish law. The two men that strayed into Iraq are in jail. I hope they'll get out. But suppose one of them stood up in court and said, I'm a citizen of the United States, and my constitution says that I'm a free man. Would that do any good with Saddam Hussein? He could care less about the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't pertain to Iraq. The law of Moses was written to regulate Jewish services and Jewish society, and we Christians are not bound by it. Now I want to give you a little something to see, and I've got to rush. If you can read this, I want you to say it out loud. Now for hundreds of years, ever since they came out of Egypt, Every year they celebrated Passover. It came in the springtime. On the 14th day of the month, Nisan, the Jews celebrated it. They ate the bitter herbs and they offered sacrifice and they ate from the sacrificial flesh. Jesus came. St. Paul said, you don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because he said, Christ is now our Passover. He has taken that out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Somebody ought to say amen out there. Not only that, but three times a year, all men folk had to go to Jerusalem. Now that was when they were all centered in that area. Suppose Christians today had to go to Jerusalem. Some of you can hardly afford to go to Tucson. <laughs> if you had to go to Jerusalem three times a year, you'd have a hardship, wouldn't you? If for no other reason, you ought to be glad that Jesus took that out of the way. Read this for me. All through the years it had meaning. God almost took Moses' son's lives because he was entering into God's service without them being circumcised. And when Moses understood, he took a sharp desert stone and circumcised his boys. What did it typify? St. Paul says circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But a keeping of the commandments of God, that's everything. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 19. Now today, when people have male children, they often have them circumcised for hygienic purposes, but not for religious purposes. If you do it for religious purposes, you're wasting your time. What did this refer to? Paul said the circumcision that counts is the circumcision of the heart 
the cutting away of the flesh and the world, getting rid of our wild earthliness, cutting loose from our habits and the crowds we used to run from. We are thus separating from the pull of the flesh. That's what circumcision referred to and Jesus nailed it to the cross. Then on Yom Kippur, they had to offer the lamb at the sanctuary for the priest. And after that, they chose two goats. One goat represented the Lord after lots were cast. The other goat represented Azazel, the devil. And the goat that represented the Lord died. And the priest having placed the sins of all of Israel on the head of that goat. And they are outside worshiping and praying and examining their hearts. It was a Sabbath. Nobody went to work. I don't care if it was Wednesday or Thursday. Everybody was seeing about his soul that day. The priest went into the sanctuary, offered the sacrifice. When he came out of there, he put his head, hands on the head of Azazel, and he was carried out into a wilderness to die, meaning that Jesus died for our sins, and eventually the devil will be destroyed and will bear the sins of the unsaved while Jesus bore the sins of the saved, making atonement for us. There's a song that says, Christ for sin atonement me. That's why we don't have to do it. That's why Christians don't observe Yom Kippur. Jesus died. And the Bible says he was once offered. How many times? Once. Doesn't have to die every year. Once offered. What does this say? Feast of harvest in the fall of the year. Then what does this one say? All of these things were in the law of Moses. What does this one say? Meat offering. They all were valid. They all meant something. What does this one say? Ceremonial Sabbath. There are seven of them in Leviticus 23. And you know what? Paul had a problem. Everywhere he went, Jewish converts and believers followed him and tried to get these brand new Gentile Christians to practice Judaism. Paul had that battle everywhere. And when he wrote to the church at Colossae, he said, don't let anybody bother you with that. With meat and drink and Sabbath days, plural, new moons, all of these things that we've observed for years, it's all done away. Why? They were just a shadow, just a symbol of the good thing to come. Jesus took that out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Read it for me. The sin offering. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What does this say? Now this was the other offering where you ate of the, of the lamb's flesh. A peace offering was used to confirm a vow or a covenant, whether with God or with a man. If two people had an agreement, they could have a peace offering. And as they ate the lamb together, they were assured that God was party to the covenant. And for a man to break his vow was considered not only a civil offense, but a spiritual offense to God, a peace offering. Jesus made peace between an offended law and wicked people and a holy God. Would somebody say amen? When Jesus died, the law demands death for the wages of sin is what? Yeah. And when Jesus died, I'm glad to tell you today, righteousness and peace shook hands. When Jesus died, justice and mercy embraced each other. Justice said when Jesus died, that's enough. And thank God tonight it's enough. It's enough to cover my sin. It's enough to cover your sin. It's enough to cover the sin of the whole world. Justice is satisfied with the death of Jesus. Don't let it be in vain as far as you are concerned. Read this to me. What in the world was that? In the spring of the year, and I've got a rush, please forgive me. In the spring of the year, the people in Israel who lived by an agricultural economy were to go out into their fields and cut some unripened grain and they tied it into a sheath and they brought it to church and presented it to the priest and he took it and waved it before the altar of God. What did it mean? It meant that if they were faithful, God sent the early rain to give them as much as they had. 
He would send the latter rain to bring the whole harvest to fruition. And this wave offering was an expression of faith that God will keep his promise and give us a harvest. Without a harvest, they might die of famine. And ladies and gentlemen, the celebration of the wave offering pointed forward to something. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, the harvest is the end of the world. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. The Bible tells us that Jesus has a sickle in his hand and he's going to reap the harvest of the earth. The harvest is the end of the world. Well, what is a wave offering then? When Jesus rose up from the dead, the Bible says other graves were shaken open and Jesus took them to heaven with him. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. He took some trophies of his victory to heaven as evidence that his sacrifice was efficacious, that his blood was powerful enough not only to save lost men, but to raise the dead. And he took them up there. The prophet said, I saw him, the four and 20 elders, which were redeemed from the earth. Would you say amen out there? They were carried and they stood before God like a wave offering. They were the promise of the coming harvest. And I look at that and say, if Jesus could raise the dead when he rose and take them to heaven when he went, that was the early thing, the wave offering. At the last day when the harvest is being called in, the trumpet is going to sound and my mother is coming up out of that cold, cold ground and the harvest of thousands upon thousands, yea, millions upon millions will go into the city of God and Jesus will present them before the Father. This is the harvest of the earth. Amen. Read this one for me. In the law of Moses, you couldn't get called to the ministry unless you came from the tribe of Levi. And that was right down to the end. Annas and Caiaphas were Levitical priests. You had to belong to a special tribe in order to be called. Well, you've heard me say I didn't want to be a preacher. Father's from my mind, but the Lord called me. Now, I'm not only not from the tribe of Levi, I'm a black man. Grew up poor down in North Carolina. But when the Lord called me, he made it so clear, I have never looked back. And he's put the proof of the call in the products of his blessings. Would somebody say amen? amen? Well, that isn't all. When Jesus went back to heaven and Paul was trying to explain that he was our high priest, some of the people said, but he wasn't a Levite. Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi. Paul said, he's not like that. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek knowing neither father nor mother. And some people stumble over that, thinking that Melchizedek didn't have a father and mother. That isn't what Paul meant. Paul meant he didn't depend on a heritage from his father to be a priest. And now Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he nailed that to the cross. No longer do you have to depend on that. He's calling red men and white men, black men, and brown men to the ministry to carry the gospel to all the world. What's this? Feast of trumpets, I, I'm so sorry, I got a rush, brethren. And now this one I want to mention. What does that say? Amen. Reading I picked her out, this particular offering was the guarantee, even among selfish, bigoted Israel, that God opened the door to Gentiles. Uh, some other time we might have to explain it. But the offering of the red heifer was God's indication way back there that the Jews weren't his only people. He loved the whole world and wanted them to carry the gospel out there. And when they didn't do it, they failed him. And eventually he nailed it to the cross. What is this? <laughs> Cleansing of the lepers. You had to get a bird, two birds. They had to die over running water. Their blood had to be sprinkled with hyssop from an earthen vessel. And it represented the cleansing of sin. Leprosy is a type of sin. They used wood, and they used an earthen vessel, and they used birds. And as they sprinkled the blood of one of these birds, the other was dipped in the blood and turned loose. And he sprinkled the air as he mounted the sky with blood, representing the fact that one day Jesus is gonna clean up the very atmosphere we breathe. Right now, there is disease in the air. 
I came out here thinking I was escaping allergens and I find myself sneezing and sneezing all over Phoenix. This hair needs straightening out. Jesus is gonna do it. And that's what it typified. And the earthen vessel represents the earth purified by the blood of Jesus. And the plants represent the vegetable kingdom. But above all, when this was applied to the leper, he was pronounced clean. What is this? Came every 50 years. When the Jubilee came, the people reclaimed their land that they had lost in transactions. And all slaves were set free. That typifies when Jesus gathers us home, there's going to be a great Jubilee. Would you say amen? amen. And the meek shall inherit the earth. We're going to get it back. The devil took it. And right now, 8% of the population controls 95% of the wealth. But when Jesus gives it back to us, the poor people are going to have their share. They're not going to be any fences over there. Not going to have to worry about savings accounts over there. Not going to worry about money over there. We're going to walk around on streets of gold. Would somebody say amen? I'm longing for the Jubilee. What does it say? That was in the law of Moses. You could only go so many furlongs. I was at a health clinic in California and there was a Jewish scholar there who taught Hebrew at USC and we had some great conversations, but on Sabbath, he wouldn't even carry his tray. Somebody else had to carry it. He wouldn't walk very far. He was adhering to something that's been nailed to the cross. This is the Feast of Tabernacles and, and I just put on here, etc. There were hundreds of them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you with me? Paul, everywhere Paul went, everywhere Paul went, he had problems with Jewish believers who had been keeping these things for years, hundreds of years. They would come along and try to tell the Gentiles, you gotta do this. And I understand it was difficult for them to give it up, but give it up they must if they believed in Jesus. Would you say amen out there? He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross to make of twain, what is twain? Jew and Gentile. What's he going to make of them? One in Christ Jesus. In Jesus there's neither east nor west, male nor female, black nor white, Jew nor Gentile. If you bring that junk into the church, you're not really in. When the Lord calls you and converts you, you become a brother and a sister to everybody who believes in Jesus. All over the world, he makes us one. Some don't know that he's done that. Now, thank you, my brethren. As the lights go down, I will hasten. Would you all forgive me if I kept you five minutes longer? Let's see this. Let's see this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Ten Commandments are not against you. Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not steal. That's for your protection. Keep these thieves from stealing. Thou shalt not kill. That's for your protection. And if folk will obey it, you won't get killed. That's not against you. It makes something out of you. Gives you character. You can say no to a harlot when you keep the commandments. Go home to your own wife. Keeps the family secure. Children secure. Come on, say amen out there. Amen. Now, the moral law of God written on two tables of with a finger of the law of Moses was written in a the law of God is inside thee the law of Moses is in the side of thee God's law according to James is a place or is the law that will be judged by moral law ten commandments the only ten of them most folk who condemn them don't even know what they say I repeated them to you tonight and some of you didn't know it's all right, learn. And then say, Jesus, I love you. And he says, if you love me, do what? Amen. Keep my commandments. God's law was written on stone. The law of Moses was written in a book. God wrote it with his own what? Amen. We're just reviewing now. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with a finger of God. There it is. You don't have to guess when you're in the truth. You don't have to wonder and find some little obscure text hoping it'll bail you out. No, 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 no. Truth will set you free. Ample proof. 
of everything God wants you to know. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them on tables of stone, not one text, several. Then we see something else, ceremonial law. That's the one that we got nailed to the cross at, written by Moses in a what? Go ahead and say it. You know, even though I've said it already, repetition deepens the impression. The more you say it, the more it'll hang in your mind. When some false prophet comes and tells you, oh, that was nailed to the cross. You'll know, ladies and gentlemen, Moses was God's leader. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of the writing of the words of this law in a book until they were finished. And he placed it in the side of the ark. Now that, that chest represents the ark of God. And he took and put the testimony into the ark and set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark that's God's law covered with mercy. Thank God the law that says thou shalt not is covered with mercy and God sits on that. In order for anybody to change God's law, first of all, they gotta go to heaven because that's where the original is. In the throne of God, he still sits on the mercy seat. Instead of golden angels, they're live angels. Lucifer used to be one. Gabriel took his place. Would somebody say amen? amen. Now, if you're going to change God's law, you've got to go to heaven. I think that's a pretty big undertaking. Once you get there, you've got to push aside the guards at the gate. Then you've got to walk down the golden streets to the middle of the city, and you've got to enter the tabernacle where God is. You've got to go past all the angels who look after things. You've got to snatch God off the throne, throw mercy aside before you can even reach the ark. I would say what Jesus said. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark. We've already covered that, let us go on. Now there is a picture indicating the ark of the covenant. That's the chest on this side with the golden angels. And that's what the people saw in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, something like that, all fiction. But in reality, that's what Israel had. And they used it in the sanctuary, and all of Israel were keenly aware of God's commands. Sabbaths in Leviticus were annual and not weekly. Now, I hope I can rush this a little bit. Uh, Passover was one. Let's go on. We don't have time to come in on them again. Unleavened bread was another in verse 6. Pentecost, verse 16. That's why all those Jews were there on the day of Pentecost. They had to come. Three times a year they had to come. And God arranged it that way. So that when the Holy Ghost came down, Peter would come out and start preaching to folk from other tongues. And they all were amazed. They said, aren't these folk Galileans? How is it we hear in our own tongue? You see how God's providence works things out? They were there. They were also there when Jesus died. They had to be there for Passover. Let's go on. Feast of Trumpets was another. Atonement, verse 27, that's another. Ceremonial Sabbath. Tabernacles the first day and tabernacles the last day. There they are. And God said to Christians, not to everybody, Christians, through Paul, don't let anybody judge you in Sabbath days. You don't have to keep these anymore. Why are you so quiet? Say amen. amen. You're not burdened with that anymore. It was contrary to us. Well, how was it contrary? Because you don't have to go to Israel three times a year. That would be contrary to me on my salary. Amen. Took it out of the way. Nailed it to his cross. The truth is so clear, I'm amazed that people get all mixed up. Jesus said, don't think that I came to destroy the, the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one John or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. Same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever will do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now this was Israel's ancient tabernacle. Later on, they got a temple and continued the same ceremonies until Jesus came. But now, as I conclude, notice these words by St. Paul. He said, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. A goat's blood couldn't wash away sin. A lamb's blood couldn't wash away sin. 
A bull's blood couldn't wash away sin. A dove's blood couldn't wash away. Paul said they couldn't make anybody perfect. All they did was point to Jesus, which stood only in meats and drinks. Now, now if that isn't clear, I'd like to know what the trouble is. Let no man judge you in meats and drinks and Sabbath days, Colossians 2.14. And now Paul says, all of these things uh, stood only in meats and drinks and divers, washings, and carnal ordinances. Carnal means fleshly ordinances imposed on them until, indicating a cessation. Until what? Well, when was that? When Jesus died on the cross. There you are. Ladies and gentlemen, the word of God is clear. Paul said in Ephesians 2, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. Is the church today without ordinances? Well, I thank God we don't have to kill any lambs. I thank God we don't have to do that. Some folk can't even kill a chicken. And the sinner was required to cut the juggler in the lamb himself. I'm glad we don't, and not only that, when the Lamb of God died on Calvary, the Bible says the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That means two. And it didn't tear from the bottom up where a man might tear it. It tore from top to bottom. What did it mean? It signified that God was through with all these blood sacrifices. Out on the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. And they had a lamb ready to die in the temple. The same folk that arranged his crucifixion now are getting back to their religion. And they had a lamb to die for Passover. And the priest sweated his knife, raised it in the air, getting ready to kill the lamb when all of a sudden there was an earthquake and the veil of the temple was torn in two. That veil was as thick as a man's hand. It had golden angels made of metallic thread. Nobody could tear that but God. And when it was torn in the earth shook, the knife dropped out of his nerveless hand. The lamb jumped down and scampered. He didn't have to die. Why? The lamb of God has died. No need killing this little lamb. Jesus has died once and for all. The lamb of God has paid. And he nailed it to his cross. But we are not without an ordinance. He gave us communion and he said, now, you don't kill lambs anymore, but as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Communion, not the killing of lambs until he come. Church, we've been telling you he's coming soon. Amen. If you believe it, say amen. amen. The signs that show his coming near are fast fulfilling year by year. He's coming soon. And when he comes, there are going to be people who have made no arrangements to meet him. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Christ is coming. Well, what about the new covenant? That's another excuse. Well, let me tell you about the new covenant. The new covenant is not doing away with the law. It's writing the law in the heart. Here we have it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Doesn't sound like he's doing away with the law to me. And I will be to them a God and they shall be my people. And that's the New Testament written by that same Paul who becomes the authority for their stumbling. Paul said the new covenant is not doing away with the commandments. It's taking it off stone and writing it in the heart. Let me show you. Suppose you were a child of God and one day somebody tried to get you commit adultery and you are tempted. You might have to run to the temple and read the law. Thou shalt not commit adultery in order to know what to do. But God said under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is coming into you. And when he comes inside of you, I'm writing my law on your heart. Now, instead of going to church to see what the law says, it's up here. You don't have to wait to talk to a preacher. As soon as that flirt makes her move, you can say, no, sir. Why? It's in my heart. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. 
That's the new covenant. Uh, if you love me, do what? Tomorrow, if you love him, be here for Sabbath service. We'll keep his commandments together. What do you say? If you love him, be here on time. You're not meeting the mayor or the governor. You're meeting Jesus. Be on time. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, friends, do you love him? I'm asking you, do you love him? Yes. Come on and answer me, do you love him? Yes. Do you want to do his will? Yes. Do you thank God for the truth tonight? Yes. You thank him for the clarity of the truth tonight? Yes. Now, if you love him, stay. Bow your heads and let us pray together to our wonderful Savior who has done all of this to save us from sin. Father, you see us. Put it in our hearts to love you and to keep your law. In Jesus' name. There is someone who cares. From Moses' law, we are free. There is someone who cares. Jesus nailed that to a tree. There is someone who cares. His blood now ransoms thee. Well, that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. The Lamb of God has died. There is someone who cares. Now see his blood applied. There is someone who cares. Just in his love abide. For that someone who cares is Jesus. Now may he bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace.